I'm Janice Edwards of Edwards Unlimited, and we're talking with former Santa Clara County Supervisor Rod Diridon Sr. about his journey to the Board of Supervisors and experiences there. So, so nice to have you here. Nice to see you again. Janice, nice to be here. Let's talk about the journey to the Board of Supervisors, what led you there, and what years you served. Janice, it was really almost an accident that I was elected to the board. I uh, was uh, from a small town, uh, kind of a, a poor town. We were all poor, so nobody knew that we were poor. Dunsmuir, California, up by Mount Shasta, a railroad town. And uh, uh, I was determined to go out and make a lot of money. So I went to college, I got an accounting degree and an MBA. Uh, and then Uncle Sam gave me an all-expense-paid tour twice to Vietnam <laughs> on a destroyer as a naval officer. Wow. So after I came back from the Navy, I went to work for Lockheed for a while. And, um, and then uh, we bought a home in the, in the poor part of Saratoga. Yeah, there is no poor part of Saratoga, but it was, mm -hmm. it was a less expensive area. And uh, the city of uh, Saratoga began to talk about taking the little open space near us on Cox Avenue and turning it into a housing development instead of a park as they promised. So I got all of the homeowners associations in the, in the city, there, I think there were 13 of them, together and we went uh, up and we advocated for the park uh, with the city of uh, Saratoga. The, the city council decided to make it a park and then the homeowners association wanted me to run for the city council. Wow. And so I did that and... You were one of the youngest people ever on I, the city I was council. the long, youngest person at that time ever elected to the city council. and. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then uh, three years later, I was elected to the County Board of Supervisors, uh, primarily, I think, because I was pretty active as a city council member, but uh, I was very strongly in favor of uh, using a portion of the tax rate, that was back when we controlled our property tax rates, uh, using a portion of that for, to build an arena uh, for the region. The mm -hmm. people had voted for it, uh, and, uh, and they were, they, in fact, it was overwhelming. Uh, that that we would build this arena and then the Board of Supervisors decided not to do that. There are also some other reasons. I, I strongly was in favor of, of women's rights and went in and advocated for the uh, the uh, status on, on uh, of, uh, women commission. I was the only elected official, male elected official there to advocate for the CSW. And this was during the 70s? Uh, this was uh, when I was on the City Council in the yes. early 70s. And, uh, and then two members of the board voted against it. One of them happened to be the, the member of the County Board of Supervisors in the district where I was living. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really bad. And, and so um, those, those things kind of encouraged me to get out and run, and, and I did. So all of a sudden I found myself on the Board of Supervisors as a very young person mm -hmm. uh, with no idea what the County Board of Supervisors did, <laughs> and, yeah, but, a, but a lot of enthusiasm. Mm. So once you were inaugurated then into that level of politics, what were some of the biggest surprises that you faced in trying to really have your vision executed and working with others? Well, my, the reason for being involved in politics was originally a park. So I'm a hardcore tree-hugging environmentalist, yes. and I'm proud to be. And, and uh, I'm also a, a businessman. I started a research company that became very successful, and. And I'm an MBA, so I'm, I'm not uh, an unreasoning environmentalist, but I'm a strong environmentalist. And so my objectives on the Board of Supervisors all related to the environment, or most of them related to the environment. My assignment, uh, the five members of the board are assigned topical areas, or they're right. called portfolios. And my portfolio was always transportation, parks, and, uh, and now and then I, I was assigned over into, into the hospital area because I came from a hospital board before being on the Board of Supervisors. And uh, so my, my responsibility area and my enthusiasm was for transportation because I knew mass transportation would reduce air pollution and air pollution was, uh, was killing people. And I knew that uh, parks were a good thing. Uh, we were, had terrible urban sprawl in the valley at that time. I had uh, been involved as one of the co-chairs of the first parks charter election in the early 70s. And so I had the opportunity of helping to implement that park charter election by using the funds that was, were created by that election to uh, begin buying a ring of land all the way around the valley right up next to the developed land so that uh, that parkland then wouldn't let services be extended into the hill lands. And mm -hmm. if you didn't have services, you couldn't have high-density development. 
and so it was a way of uh, creating a buffer zone that stopped urban sprawl. So those are my, my Very priorities. Very strategic in that mm -hmm. way. Let's talk a little bit more about what has fueled your passion for the park system. Well, I think the park, the, the, the enthusiasm for the park program first came because I, I grew up on the slopes of Mount Shasta and I, you know, I was a, a kid. Uh, our home was right up on seven acres up on the, the steep mountainside and mm. I, I grew up uh, cutting poles and, and running a trap line. I know how terrible that is now, but uh, back then it was, uh, it was uh, an appropriate thing to do and, and I, uh, I, uh, we hunted and fished for food uh, for the family and so I, I realized the beauty and, and, the, and the wonderfulness of the outdoors and, uh, and transferred that, getting away from the hunting and the fishing and the trapping. Uh, very adamantly, by the way, and, and transferred that to a desire to keep the open space lands around Santa Clara County from being destroyed by urban sprawl. And the way we crafted to do that, and, and others were involved in that tactical process too, Dan McCorkadale especially, uh, Jerry Steinberg, uh, later Suzanne Wilson, um, uh, and, and many others uh, that worked on protecting against urban sprawl, Diane McKenna. Uh, and we, uh, <coughs> we crafted a procedure for using the significant money that was created by the Parks Charter Amendment to buy large tracts of land that were right next to the developed areas so that the developers couldn't extend services through that parklands mm. and then create uh, urban sprawl by developing up into the hills. Now that's worked to some extent on the west side. It hasn't worked as well on the east side. Well, I was going to say you must have faced a lot of opposition and a lot of really having to work together to make sure that you were protecting the parks with the vision because you, when you're balancing all of the needs and the finances mm -hmm. of the county decisions, that must have been challenging at times. Well, as a matter of fact, it, it, it really was. We, uh, we at one point had accumulated $12 million, which back then was quite a little bit of money, uh, and, uh, and the county executive, who was not enthused about the parks programs uh, at that time, Sally Reed, uh, discouraged her parks people from spending that money on park acquisitions. Well, the board would, would instruct them to do it, and then all sorts of delays occurred so that the money accumulated in the account and wasn't spent on the land. Uh, and, and we had to then force it to be spent. In fact, we, we spent a big chunk of that money on building the first portion of the Park of the Guadalupe. Mm. Wow, and that's been amazing and incredible and mm -hmm. successful, and people look to that, yeah, that in so many ways as a community resource. That, that r the credit for that really goes to, uh, I'm, I'm happy to have been involved, but uh, Zoe Lofgren really helped a lot in that, and of course it was her district. Yes. When you think about just the culture of the board during the years that you were there, how would you characterize it, and do you have any thoughts about how it, the was serving then and what you see today on the Board of Supervisors. Yes, I'm glad you asked that. And I'd like to get back, by the way, to talk about transportation when we have a chance. But yes. let me talk about uh, the, r the rather distinct change that occurred at the beginning of the 1970s. At the end of the 1960s, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it was uh, an interview with the then parks director for the county, who was very much opposed to the way the cities were promoting urban sprawl. And uh, he and the Wall Street Journal described Santa Clara County as the most poorly planned community in the United States. Wow. And when that hit the headlines and was repeated by other media, uh, we saw a big changeover in the uh, people elected to the city council and to the Board of Supervisors. So the first time in the history of the county, uh, the Board of Supervisors became dominated not by the farming groups that had been the dominant force for a hundred years on the Board of Supervisors, but rather by uh, younger, typically younger, uh, well-educated, uh, uh, environmentally oriented people. Uh, the registration flip-flopped from being primarily Republican, although it's a nonpartisan seat, being primarily Republican people to Democrats, uh, and uh, from business people to environmental oriented people, although we're all business. Right. And, uh, and also from being from part-time supervisors to being full-time supervisors. Uh, the, uh, the action was taken at the recommendation of the grand jury that the board members uh, spend at least 80% of their time 
as members of the Board of Supervisors, and their salaries were adjusted to be 80% of a Superior Court judge salary, which was a huge change from the way it had been before. So all of a sudden you had a full-time group who were smart, they all had advanced degrees, and they were all motivated, and they were all trying to do better, especially as it related to the environment. And what a change from uh, what had occurred only five years before. Uh, in I think it was a very good change. A civic revolution. And oh, yes. Yeah. So, and what you know about the board today, does it seem to you that it's just evolved naturally from that big revolution, or, or are you looking at things that have changed now, and do you see that with the economy, other revolutions, if you will, have occurred? Well, uh, the, the attempt at moving us towards a, a very much stronger environmental position that occurred during the 70s and corresponded with an environmental movement nationally in the 70s. It was represented by Jerry Brown being elected for the first time at the, at the state level and, and others. Uh, that kind of ran into a brick wall with the patch, passage of Proposition 13. What happened there is that Prop 13 reduced the amount of revenue coming to local governments, counties especially, by about uh, anywhere between 25 and, and 40 percent. That money w was eliminated. It was no longer collected, but the property taxes that were collected were, went to the state and were submitted back then to the, to the uh, counties. So the counties lost an awful lot of control over their own destiny by losing taxing authority, and they had to cut back services dramatically. The, re the result was that there was a powerful move on the part of the counties and the cities towards creating tax base. Well, tax base means development. So the attempts that we had, that had followed for so many years to not see rampant development and not to see the development go up into the hills was frustrated by an overwhelming desire to create more tax base. And uh, that, I think, uh, tended to frustrate the environmental efforts on into the late 80s and uh, even more so as we went into the 90s. We went through peaks and hollows of um, economic development. And so looking at the Board of Supervisors today, what are your thoughts about what you contributed that you see continuing? Well, I think uh, that which people associate with me most is probably the uh, transportation programs, and I'm very proud of them. Uh, when I first came on the board, uh, the transportation programs were terrible. We had uh, just created the transit agency under the Board of Supervisors, and uh, it was awful. The, the, they had. 135 twin coaches, which were little plastic buses that ran on propane that tended to burn up periodically. Oh. Very awkward when you're going home and you're proud of being in charge of transportation and you're seeing your bus burn down. Oh my gosh. <coughs> they burnt slowly, so <laughs> nobody was ever hurt, but it was still a terrible oh thing. And, and so the board members gave the youngest member of the board that responsibility because they didn't want it. So that's how you so, became the father of uh, modern that's, transit. That's that was it, because it didn't have a father. <laughs> And uh, so we went on through and did the studies that are required by the federal government. And we, it was rapid transit development project phase one. The, uh, we then went, went on into building the right light rail system, develop a master plan for light rail expansion, the bus expansion. Uh, I chaired the Caltrain uh, uh, study committee, which was called the Peninsula Corridor Joint Powers Board, uh, a precursor, which is a, a Peninsula Transportation Alternative Project. And, uh, and uh, I was on the uh, Capital Quarter Board and the Alphamont Express Board and the others. I chaired, I think, nine different rail construction projects at one point. And so really enjoyed building to a master plan that came out of that uh, early uh, rapid transit development project phase one, and uh, which I proposed to the board and was adopted as the master plan for transportation for the valley. It's been since modified and adopted several times. Has to, I think it has to be ad adopted every four or five years. And, but um, interestingly, two weeks ago, uh, the uh, local newspaper, in fact, newspapers all across the United States, carried an article indicating that Santa Clara Valley had the best planned transportation system in the continental United States. Yes. The yes. only one better was Honolulu. And so that master plan that was developed back then that we're now building to, as we get a little money, we build another light rail line or build another station here and there. That's identified now as the best plan in the United States. And you should have, and you do have such pride in that because well, that's really quite do. a tribute. Well, it, it, it's going to allow us to be sustainable. 
when other areas that have a hodgepodge of different transportation programs, especially only uh, highways to, to deal with, uh, will not be able to survive economically because they won't be able to get people to work or products to the marketplace. It's incredible to see now what has happened. But I'm thinking when you were given this opportunity because no one else at the time wanted it, yeah. and, and then you became the father of modern transit, how did you have the vision and with whom did you work and collaborate so that you could really perceive something that would be sustainable for all these years as it has been and will continue to be? Janice, I, I guess it came from me a little bit viscerally. Uh, I didn't realize it. But I worked my way through college as a brakeman and a fireman on the railroad. For seven years, every vacation, every long weekend, every summer, I was up there running the big freight trains up and down the tracks around Dunsmuir to pay my way through college. I didn't like that work. It, <laughs> it, it's tough, hard work and dangerous work. It, it really taught me why I was going to college. <laughs> uh, but I guess I learned enough about it and appreciated it enough that uh, when I got the assignment from the Board of Supervisors, I had a basic idea of how transportation systems work and how to integrate them. And so, uh, so coming then into the responsibility presented by the Board of Supervisors, knowing that we were rapidly growing as a metropolitan area, mm -hmm. Silicon Valley had started to take off. We knew we were going to double in population very quickly. We knew we couldn't take care of the people on the highways because we didn't have enough dirt to pave. You, you know, we, mm -hmm. The highways were expanded out to the edges. and So we knew in order to be able to sustain our I environmental integrity and, and uh, economic vitality, we had to be able to move people sustainably. And, and across the world, that means moving people on electrically powered transportation system, on mass transportation systems. So we, uh, we did the studies that led to the light rail system. The light rail system master plan is 140 miles of, uh, of that light rail program. It's all master planned around the, the region. And there, there are lines on maps that have, been, that have come from millions of dollars worth of studies and then approved by the state and federal government. And, and they're ready to be built as soon as we have the money to do so. All integrated through interconnecting stations with BART and with high-speed rail and with um, and with the bus feeder and distribution system. Yes, it is an incredible system. And of course, when you look at those maps and whenever you go to Diridon Station, that's quite a tribute. What did you feel about learning that that station was going to be named for you? Well, I, I was amazed. Uh, there's, a, there's a tendency to wait until people die before they name things after mm -hmm. them. In fact, I ran into a little kid down there. I, was pick, I picked my wife up uh, in the evening and dropped her off in the morning uh, at the station. She works in San Francisco. You know her You're very right. well. Dr. Dr. Gloria Duffy. Dr. Yes. Gloria Duffy, president of the Commonwealth Club, yeah. who I'm very proud of. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I dropped, uh, dropped her off in the morning, I guess it was, and I ran into this young fellow who was standing out in front. I said, uh, what do you think about this station? And he says, oh, it's cool, it's really neat. And, and there's a new museum, by the way, inside the station on the history, transportation yes. history of the, uh, of the region that was prepared by History San Jose and the Rotary Club. Yeah. <coughs> so I asked him, um, well, who's this Deardon guy? And, and the little fellow said, well, I don't know, but he's got to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, it, it's, a, it's a kick. And, did uh, you scare him, and, and did he think you were a ghost then at that point? No. <laughs> no. In fact, I let, him, I let him think it was dead. Oh. <laughs> we just, I didn't mention anything more. No, it, uh, that station is going to have more trains through it than any station on the West, on the west Coast, certainly. Um, uh, except maybe Union Station in Los Angeles. Wow. It's going to have between 600 and 1,000 trains a day through it by 2020, including BART trains and, and light rail vehicles and high-speed trains and Caltrain, the Altamont Express, the Capital trains, uh, uh, and, and so on. Uh, there will be millions of people, oh, tens of millions of people a year through that station. Yes. Well, that is quite exciting. Mm -hmm. And congratulations again on that honor. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very pleasurable, pride-worthy. I can tell that you have such a passion for civic engagement. When you think about the future of Santa Clara County, what do you consider the most important issues to address right now? Well, let me use that as a segue to, uh, to a couple of other things that I'm really proud of that I wanted to mention on the, on the tape. Yes. Because the jobs are not done there. One of the most important of those is human rights. Uh, I've, I've been a, 
a strong progressive in terms of women's rights, gay rights, and rights of all human beings. Yes, and he champions the gay rights ordinance. I was going to mention that. Uh, Santa Clara County, uh, with the leadership of, of uh, Dan McCorkadale and Susie Wilson and, and myself and Dom Cortese, uh, back in the late 1970s, adopted the first gay rights ordinance in California at any level. And we were really proud of, of that ordinance. It uh, didn't have a whole lot of impact because it only affected the unincorporated area of the county, but it was a signal to everyone uh, that, that uh, being prejudiced against people for any purpose, for any reason, even sexual orientation, was inappropriate. And it was referended by the growing moral majority, which, by the way, was neither a majority or moral. And uh, we, uh, in fact, the three of us had recall papers taken out against us by the same people but the recalls failed. And, but, but we were able to set a signal out there that the state then picked up and others picked up to be able to take a stand on that important issue. Uh, the, uh, w at the same time that that was happening, we were this, the first county, and I was the leader on this, and I'm proud of it, uh, to have a, a solar ordinance, a requirement that solar uh, photovoltaic cells and uh, hot water solar be added to any building constructed in the unincorporated area of the county, which is where we had land use control. Uh, that lasted for about six months, and then the state stepped in and, and adopted what year was their, that again? Yeah, they, they adopted their own solar ordinance, which then preempted the, the county's ordinance. And but what year was that? Uh, I think it was 1978 or 79. So really visionary in terms of solar ordinance. Well, it was. It, yet Silicon Valley was at the cutting edge of solar at that time way ahead of Germany and Japan and, and China, mm -hmm. which are now uh, dominating yes. that market. Yeah. Uh, if we'd only been able to keep the emphasis on solar, first of all, we would have been much more sustainable as a society in America. And secondly, we, we might have been able to capture that industry completely for Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. There are several other ordinances that of which you are proud additionally that have to do with other countries, the region of Moscow and also oh, the yes. province of Florence. You're pretty quick. <laughs> that, those are two uh, ordinances which are not profound. They don't change the world, but they were pretty darn nice, and I think they reflected the fact that Silicon Valley was more than just another county. And uh, uh, the visitors uh, that came to the valley included, uh, on two occasions, two different occasions, the, the uh, president of the province of Florence, Italy, uh, Alberto, Alberto Brasca, who came to my office, I was chair of the board, and he, he said, we ought to have a germolagio. I don't know what that means, <laughs> but he, uh, we linked arms and drank some red wine and-, and uh, Sounded good. <laughs> uh, that, was, that part was good. <laughs> and uh, so we created a sister county relationship through an ordinance and, uh, and have appointed that commission, the, the board of supervisors have appointed that commission uh, since that time. And this was in the early 1980s. And uh, every other year, the, uh, the commission sends a delegation, including a member of the Board of Supervisors, to Florence to promote uh, commerce and to uh, exchange culture and, and to, to do other kinds of things that helps the, the two communities work together. The same thing happened with the, uh, with the uh, president of the region of Moscow. And uh, he, he was actually called the uh, Governor General of the region of Moscow. He came to uh, California to visit. I wasn't sure about meeting this great big uh, Russian uh, a communist, uh, but uh, he turned out to be a really nice guy, and he also suggested a, a sister county relationship. And I looked at him and I said, "Why should we do that?" And he, in his great big gruff voice, he says, "Because you don't bomb your friends." And so that was a good reason. Uh, wow. So if we became friends, we would be mm -hmm. less likely to bomb each other. And 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 it since since then it became a very strong bond that that helped the two communities communicate communicate very effectively. Yes. Well, on a personal note, Italy is very near and dear to your heart because of your family roots. Well, my roots are from Pisa, although that's completely coincidental. Mm -hmm. I, the, the fellow from Tuscany didn't know that when he came here, from Florence didn't know that when he came to talk to us. Uh, but my family, uh, my father's family, <coughs> my dad changed his name in the 19, late 1930s from uh, Claudius Diridoni to Claude Diridon. Because he wanted to work for the railroads and they wouldn't hire an Italian when we were at war with Italy. So uh, he changed his name and my name became Diridon even before I was created. 
but uh, they they came from Tuscany, uh, from Pisa and Florence, and and uh, it's it's wonderful to be able to go and see them from time to time. Oh, that is special. You know, we were talking about some of the ordinances and where you faced opposition. Were there any additional difficult projects that you encountered being on the Board of Supervisors, some that were successful or unsuccessful that you'd like to discuss? Well, every, it seemed like every major effort was a battle, especially later after Prop 13 when the funding was more dear. Uh, I remember one of the battles that we had for a long time, which is now being played out, was, the, was whether or not to ditch Valley Medical Center, that mm -hmm. great, wonderful uh, educational hospital that it's the education hospital for Stanford University yes. uh, and there were some members of the board and the county executive who wanted to get rid of it and uh, other members like myself said no we shouldn't get rid of it we should make it a even a more wonderful uh, facility that will attract not only uh, poor people uh, as the hospital of last resort but also paying people who will help pay for the poor people mm -hmm. and finally after several years of wrangling and fighting and master planning uh, with the great help of Bob Sillen, who was the director of the hospital, uh, we were able to get adopted a master plan with a bonding program that uh, has now expanded the hospital, uh, replaced the old earthquake-prone uh, buildings, and uh, have, uh, has allowed the hospital to become a truly modern uh, burn center, a trauma center, and uh, serving all the other purposes that we need here in our valley. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> Talking a little bit about family, you mentioned Dr. Gloria Duffy, your wife. You are a father and a grandfather. When you think about the county now, compared to what you experienced and what you've helped shape, what do you hope your grandchildren will enjoy as part of the legacy of Santa Clara County? Uh, Janice, uh, I look at the future with real trepidation. I worry about the future. I lose sleep over the future. I, I, I know global warming is occurring. It's accelerating according to the uh, National Geographic and other science magazines. And, and uh, unless we do something radical quickly about it, uh, we're going to lose this opportunity in history for humankind. And my babies are involved in that. So I, 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 I'm doing all I can to promote sustainability. I speak three or four times in, in foreign countries around the world. In fact, I'm going shortly to China and uh, to give a keynote speech, and I was there in December, uh, to promote uh, sustainability. Sustainability purely and simply means shifting from petroleum-based power to uh, solar and wind-based power to non-petroleum-based power. And uh, we can do that in California better than most areas because we have so much sun and we have wind in certain places and we have great hydroelectric power coming down from the, from the streams. And so I really am concerned that we, we move into sustainability determinedly and immediately and move away from, from uh, petroleum-based power. I've had an electric car since 1996. I retrofitted a little red Porsche uh, <laughs> at, in 1996 and have had electric cars ever since that time. Our, our home has photovoltaic cells on the roof. We don't, we're, a, uh, we're a net contributor back to the grid in terms of electricity. Mm -hmm. our, our, our swimming pool has the hot water solar associated with it. So uh, we're trying the best to, to live what we, what we talk, uh, walk the talk, and uh, I know my wife is, feels the same way, uh, but the whole world needs to step up to this. Now, when you travel in other countries, you probably do this quite frequently yourself, you'll notice that the other countries of the world are frantic about global warming. China is, is especially frantic because China and India, India represent 40% of the world's population and their water comes from the Himalayas. The Himalaya snowpack has, has been reduced. Glacier uh, conditions have been reduced by 20 to 40% since 1950 in only 60 years. 40% of the Himalayas snowpack is gone. Well, when that 40% of the world's population doesn't have any water to drink, they're not going to say, gee, that's too bad. They're going to look at the United States and say, you're 4% of the world's population, and you create 30% of the greenhouse gases. That's not right, and we have to fix it here in America. So that's where I'm, that's where I'm at now. That's why I'm uh, leading the Mineta Transportation Institute that, that promotes uh, sustainable transportation. 
Well, we thank you for all of your dedication, your civic concerns, your vision, and it's been a pleasure to reflect with you upon your time and your legacy as a member of the Board of Supervisors. Thank you so much. Oh, Rod. thank you for your professionalism and uh -huh. for your cordiality. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And we thank you for joining us.